Welcome to Up In Your Business with Carrie McCoy. Be sure to stay tuned to the end of the show to hear how you can get a copy of this program and other helpful documents. And now it's time for Carrie McCoy to get all up in your business. I'm Carrie McCoy, and like Tim said, it's time for me to get up in your business. For the next hour, my guest, Tommy Jamison, and I will be getting up in the business of how we maneuvered the path of leadership and entrepreneurship in pursuit of our dreams. We'll be telling stories, answering questions, and giving advice via phone and email. My business experience began over 40 years ago when I founded Arkansas Flag and Banner. During the last four decades, Arkansas Flag and Banner has grown and morphed from door-to-door sales to telemarketing to mail order and catalog sales, and now relies heavily on the internet. Each change in sales strategy required a change in company thinking and procedures. My confidence, leadership knowledge, and my company grew. My initial $400 investment now produces nearly $4 million in annual sales. I think we're going to hit $4 million this year. Each week on this show, you'll hear candid conversations between me and my guest about real-world experiences on a variety of business and topics that I hope you'll find interesting. Running a business or organization is like so many things. It takes persistence, perseverance, and patience. I worked part-time jobs for nine years before Arkansas Flag and Banner grew enough to support just me. It's now grown and expanded so much that to operate efficiently, we require, are you ready? A purchasing, manufacturing, graphic, shipping, technology, accounting, marketing, sales, and customer service department, plus a retail store, and now i got a radio show. What do you call that? Media marketing? I don't know. 25 people make their living from working at Arkansas Flag and Banner. I hope you'll take advantage of this unique opportunity to ask questions or share your experience by calling or emailing me and my guest on today's show. Before we get started, I want to introduce the people at the table. We have Tim Bowen, our technician, who will be taking your calls and pushing the buttons. Say hello, Tim. Hello, Tim. (laughs) <laughs> he does that every week, Tommy. I love that. My guest today is Tommy Jameson of Jameson Architects. Tommy became interested in historic architecture during his senior year of college, so much so that not long after his 1977 graduation from the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville, he moved back to Little Rock and bought his first historic home, I guess in your 20s. And one block away. Wow, neat. From where we are. Cool. You'll have to tell us about that in a minute. Since that time, he and his wife have rehabilitated three more historic homes, including the office of Jameson Architects, a 1904 Colonial Revival cottage near the Arkansas State Capitol, and the 1936 Warner Noop House in Little Rock's Hillcrest neighborhood. In 1996, almost 20 years after Tommy graduated from college, he founded Jameson Architects, P.A., which focuses on the development of thoughtful, creative preservation solutions for homes, office buildings, and neighborhoods. The firm's website states, our collaboration with a variety of specialized consultants offers unique, multidisciplinary insights for complex preservation issues that go beyond just architecture. Our goal for every project, large or small, is to fulfill the highest client expectations by creating sensitive design solutions for historic buildings, homes, or sites. Jameson's Architects' award-winning work has helped to save many of our state's irreplaceable historic structures. Tommy is committed to an ongoing effort to preserve Arkansas's architectural heritage. Thank you, Tommy. (laughs) Welcome to the table, Tommy Jamison, founder of the award-winning firm, Jamison Architects, P.A. Tell everybody what P.A. means. Professional Association. I, thought so, I, I Googled it. I thought it meant professional architects. No, it's like another way of saying incorporated. Oh, really? In Arkansas. I learn something every day on my show. When describing yourself, you said you and your wife rehabilitated your home and office. Is there a reason you use the word rehabilitated and not renovated? I prefer rehabilitation in that it... I feel like it's on drugs or something. It connotates uh, keeping things that are significant, possibly, and adding things that make structures more livable. So it's not a restoration. Renovation makes it sound like you're uh, 
making it new. Speaking of renovation and restoration, there is a difference. And Absolutely. When you, yes. Explain. I it, I didn't know this till I bought an old till I bought the you know Taborian Hall in downtown Little Rock. And when you call for your tax credits, they ask you, are you renovating or restoring? And I was like, I don't know. What's the difference? Well, restoration is when you are taking a structure to a particular date and time. Now, that's tip, which one? Tip restoration. Res you're you're restoring, restoring to a particular time. And so if you've got a structure that is, uh, well, for example, uh, we're working on a structure that was built in 1846. It was moved in 1886. Our first photograph and good documentation is about 1914. So we're using a date of interpretation of 1914, 1910 to 1914, early turn of the century, because we can't move it back to where it was. Because you don't have a picture. Because it moved. Oh. It's been moved about 80 feet. Uh, it was on the banks of Bayou Bartholomew, and the bank was sloughing off, so they moved the structure. Is that Ann Bryant's home? No, that is uh, Hollywood Plantation, the Taylor House at Hollywood Plantation. Oh, I love that name. University of Arkansas at Monticello owns it now. Oh, okay. Uh, it's in Drew County, near Winchester, close to Selma, uh, 10, 15 minutes from Dumas. So it's so you've moved it, and because no, you... No, it moved. It was moved in before the turn in the 1880s. So... We can't restore it to 1846 because you have to pick up, for restoration, you have to pick a particular date in time. And so most residential work, houses that people live in, are not restorations per se. Now, there are exceptions to that. I mean, if you look at Carl Miller's Diverol House, that's a restoration. Uh, there are, there are, anything that's added that's modern is very hidden and concealed. But typically, restoration is, uh, taking a structure to a specific date and time as accurately as possible. Where rehabilitation is taking those sensitive things about the structure and adding modern conveniences or uses or code compliance issues or you, know, you think of the old state house, it's a restoration. You know, it's, those rooms are going back to the way they were, although some rooms are rehabilitated because some are, some are turned into galleries and extra walls are added. Oh yeah. So there, there, are, there are differences. So the Dreamland Ballroom on the third floor of the Arkansas Flag and Banner Building, right. I am not taking it back to any time, any particular right. time. Right. I'm leaving it just as raw. Well, you can throw in another word, and that would be conservation, to conserve oh. it like it is. Oh. <laughs> is that new? No. It's not used very often. Because that wasn't a question they asked me. Right. But you could, that could be a good answer for you. And all three of those are eligible for tax credits. Yes. And you can very many people do that without hiring you. I don't want to get sure. too much into this because it's the second part of our show. but Sure. They can do that on their own? It can be done on your own. There's, there's folks at the Arkansas Historic Preservation Program that will help through those processes. So did you go to college to be an architect? Yes. How did you know you wanted to be an architect? Nobody goes to school for what they think they're going to be when they grow up to be. You're one of the few people I've interviewed that actually got a degree in, and work in that degree. I was in 11th grade at Hall High and uh, sat down for the first time with a guidance counselor. And she looked at my, you know, my grades and what I was doing, and I was acing all the mechanical drawing classes. I was doing well in math and sciences. And she said, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I was thinking about commercial art because I had always been, uh, my mother had been an art major and I was, uh, got a lot of blue ribbons in elementary school doing elementary art, that kind of thing. Um, and so I said, I'm thinking maybe commercial art. And she said, have you ever considered architecture? And I went, no, <laughs> but started thinking about it. And about that time, my dad was with uh, Union National Bank and they were building their new tower and I got some tours of that, and I started thinking, yeah, this could be pretty neat. So your father was in construction? Banking. Oh, your father was in banking? He was with the bank as they were building their new building. And so um, we ended up moving to Malvern, Arkansas for my senior year of high school, and I applied to Tulane to go to architecture school, started looking at architecture schools. And uh, Tulane was one of the better schools in the country at the time. and. Uh, my grades weren't quite good enough to get there, so they put me on a waiting list, and, and I basically said, hmm, I didn't really want to go there anyway. <laughs> so I uh, applied to Fayetteville and uh, went to Fayetteville. 
That's a great story. Do you write that counselor a thank you note ever? Um, I couldn't tell you her name right now to save my life. Well, you know, that's a if any guidance counselors are out there listening, they do make a difference in children's they lives. Can. Absolutely. Did with me. Did with me. Well, this is a great place to take a. Oh, well, let me ask you: is, is is architecture four year degree? Five. Now, so, I think it's basically six now, but it was five to get a bachelor of architecture when I was there, seventy two through seventy seven. It was five years. All right, this is a great place to take a break. When we come back, we're going to hear from Tommy, who went from being an employee to opening his own architectural firm and what that was like, what mistakes he thinks most homeowners make when they're renovating, and about the strict preservation laws, tax credits, and how to apply. You're listening to Up In Your Business. My guest is the architect and preservationist Tommy Jamison of Jamison Architects. You're listening to Up In Your Business with Carrie McCoy. I'm speaking today with the highly knowledgeable preservationist Tommy Jamison of Jamison Architects. He's, he's making a roll in his eyes when I said highly knowledgeable. You are. Just that first intro shows how much you know. So you uh, worked for somebody for 20 years. Who did you work for? What did you tell us about those years? Well, I ended up having a great opportunity to work for Blast Riddick Chilcote, a, one of the three big firms in town in the summer of 1976, between my fourth and fifth year. And uh, it made my last year in college great because uh, they wanted me to come back. So I had a job. When you graduated college. Yeah. Wouldn't kids so love that today? That last semester, all my friends were putting resumes together and getting ready to go look in, and I'm going, so let's go to Dixon Street. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to do that. Um, and so I worked for the Blast Firm for two years, uh, a little just under two years, and had bought a house. I decided I wanted to come back and buy a historic house. So I had graduated. I moved back to Little Rock, was living with my parents in Jacksonville at the time, and uh, started looking and found a house actually one block away from where we're sitting right now at 2119 Scott and purchased it, uh, moved in on 4th of July, and uh, started rehabilitating it. What year was that? 1977. Oh, it really was. the. Didn't that the same year you graduated? It was, it was two months after I graduated. So you're like 21 or 2 or something. Three. Okay. Five years of college. Oh, that's right. And uh, so I started getting involved in the QQA. And, uh, Tell everybody a, what QQA a, means. Paul Quarter Association, okay. Little Rock, Greater Little Rock's Preservation Organization and uh, was doing some volunteer work. I was driving a bus, a van, one afternoon for some small tour or something, and uh, one of the individuals giving it said, well, what are you doing and all that sort of thing, and uh, um, I explained I was a young intern architect and whatnot and that I had my house on Scott Street, and she said, I've heard of these two guys that left the Cromwell firm starting their own firm to do historic work and infill projects in historic neighborhoods. And I said, that sounds neat. She said, I hear they're looking for people, looking for, looking for a person anyway. So uh, that was Charles Switzel and Don Evans. Right. And so I joined them in 79 and spent 15 years working directly with Charles and, and of course with Don also. And the firm grew up from there were four of us, five of us to you know, a 20 person firm, 18, 16, 18, 20, somewhere around in there. And uh, I was I was happy. I grew up as a, uh, became a, I got licensed while there, became an associate, a senior associate, and then a, and then a junior partner. Oh, really? Yeah. That's and so that was uh, up until 94. And in 94, I, uh, 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 we were, things were fine at, at, at WR. And, uh, but I ran into an old friend and we spoke about work and he said we ought to talk and we talked every other night for a couple of weeks and I resigned and joined him. And Who, that was oh. Robin Bournet. Oh, yeah. And so we were Bournet and Jameson for two and a half years. Uh, and then that led up to 96 when, when we decided to part and I started Jameson Architects. Took one of our employees and moved down 12 feet and over 20 feet up above Cafe Bossa Nova. And uh, so we were there for several years until uh, I had a great landlord. Uh, I just hated writing that check every month. 
and so I started looking around to develop an office, and that's when I found 300 Pulaski. And so it will, will be 19 years this 4th of July uh, that we completed the renovation, rehabilitation, and moved <laughs> into 300 Pulaski. Is there anything about starting your own firm that you were surprised to know that you didn't expect? Well, I, I suppose in a way, uh, I, I sort of eased into it by, by uh, having the two and a half year partnership with Robin. Uh, we, had a, we, had a, we had a thriving little business, and, and, uh, but, but our practices were so different. Uh, uh, we, we were like two small firms working under the same roof. Because you did preservation. And, and he was doing medical oriented work. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we shared a staff. And so uh, it was really quite easy when I started my own business. So I had a, a sort of a breaking in period. And I had never aspired to have my own business. It was just suddenly at that point in my career at nearly 20 years out. Um, it, just, it just, you know, I thought, I can do this. Yeah, you had the confidence. It just, it just sort of came upon me, yeah. Um, so there wasn't one catalyst that just said, today's no. the day. No. Um, so you didn't have any real surprises about it, but what, what's the most challenging thing you think probably today about owning your own small business? And how many employees do you have? Well, I have three full-time employees and a part-time office manager. Um, so there's five and a half, four and a half of us. And... Uh, Oh, I think the, uh, I, I love to, to, to say the phrase, uh, owning your business is great. You only have to work a half a day, and you get to pick which 12 hours. <laughs> so, uh, you know, all of the things I have, I have the, the manager's hat, I have the janitor's hat, I have the, uh, the landlord hat, I have the, the HR hat, I have the IT hat. I mean, and then I've got projects to do. Yeah. So uh, the, the demands on your time are significant because you don't have anybody to dole those responsibilities out to. Or at least I don't have 25 employees such as you do. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I like having more employees. Some right. people are like, I don't want to grow. Small is beautiful. I don't want to grow because you do end up doing HR work. And really, that's about right. all I do anymore. Right. But I love having a lot of employees because you get to delegate and and do other things you're not like you said having to be everything that to everybody right in a in a small architectural firm though i'm the only licensed architect so i am the ultimate responsible party uh, and, uh -huh. and, and there's liability issues and all those kinds of things so growing a, a small architectural firm with a lot of people under you still it, it all still has to funnel across my desk <laughs> I was going to ask you if how who the four employees were and were they independent architects that are just kind of renting a space at your office? They no. all actually work for your on yes. your projects that you're yes. working on. Yes, they each have uh, three to four projects apiece. That and are your so, projects. And so I've got twelve. So you're oh great. So that is a lot of work. Yeah, and and generally, um, I've had a lot of employees over the years. And I don't know that uh, I've done anything to run anybody off, but uh, I've got my senior employee has been with me 10 years. Uh, I've got a young lady that's been with me four years and a young lady that's been with me two years. Well, so, and, and they're, they're young. One's, one's just passed all the tests uh, and two are in the queue to do their intern development program to uh, gain the experience that you have to have before you sit for the exam to become a licensed architect. Well, that's nice of you, and you're, I mean, you're kind of paying it forward. You're kind of... Well, and that's, that's how the profession generally works. I mean, college teaches you how to design. Uh, you really, once you get out, you start learning how buildings go together. And how to work with customers. By doing the drawings and, and, and also how to work with people. And the city. And the city. Working with the city is a and big the, deal. And the state. And the state. And, the fe and if you're doing tax credits, the federal government. Via, via the state. The, the state's sort of the gatekeeper for that. Oh, good. We're going to talk about that in the next segment. But right now, what I don't, is it? I don't do federal work. You don't? No. I, I find it frustrating. Thank you. I even wrote that, that when every time I call the federal government, I'm frustrated, and, and I edited it out before I came on the show because I thought, I don't want to talk negatively about the federal government. But it is frustrating to call up there. It's a, it's a, big, uh, it's a big operation, and I've always, when I was, in my career at the Witzel firm, I was always sort of known as the small projects guy, mm -hmm. but worked on a uh, prospectus development study for expanding the Capitol Avenue uh, post office and courts building. Well, you know how long ago that got done. 
Where, not, not many years ago. Where is that? Capitol and Broadway. The huge, oh, yeah. the huge courts expansion. Well, I started working on that in 1994, and it got finished about five or six years ago. As an artist roughly. person, it's probably frustrating. So it took a very long time, and I personally just prefer the more rapid turnover of smaller projects. Well, I think you can be more creative. Well, and you get more opportunity to, and you get bogged down in less bureaucracy. So what are you most proud of? Speaking of projects, is, there a, is it a project you're proud of, your company mission, your management style? What would you say you're most proud of right now? I suppose when I go back and look through the projects we've done, it's, it's, it's what we've accomplished. Uh, we've managed to work on some of the oldest log structures in the state. Uh, 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 from the Jacob Wolf House built in 1829 to the Rice Upshaw House up in Randolph County in 1828. An 1832 structure up there, now the 1846 uh, uh, Taylor House at Hollywood Plantation. Um, those projects have, have, those buildings were not going to be here much longer. And so they've really been saved, and, and, I, and I feel good about that. Uh, I enjoyed seeing John Kane just a minute ago because uh, Mosaic Templars is one of my favorite projects. I feel that that. That, that was a pivotal project at the corner of Ninth and Broadway. Uh, the fire was tragic, but you know the, the legacy of the building lives on. It looks beautiful. And, and I did my first cost estimate on that building in 95, uh, working for John and the group of volunteers that were trying to save it. It looks beautiful. Thank you. And uh, it was beautiful before. It was. It looks very <laughs> similar to what it looked like before. You did it's a great. Y'all did a, a great. You and John did a great job. I think the uh, the the administration at Department of Heritage and I came up with the term. It's a faithful facsimile. Was there anything in the cornerstone? You know how they say the cornerstones yep. are awful hollow and they have stuff in them. Yes. Was there anything in Mosaic Templars uh, cornerstone? There were a couple of things, and I can't remember exactly what all was there. Um, but the one thing I do remember is there was a. Uh, a letterhead from Frank Blaisdell, the architect. Really? It was just letterhead. No words? No words on it. He didn't say a thing about <laughs> building the... Not a thing, <sighs> but he put a piece of his letterhead in the cornerstone. I can't believe he didn't say, <laughs> fun to work they on this have, project. They have the other, uh, well, and, and we did some things like that to go in the new cornerstone. Good. Yeah. Can you tell us what's in the time capsule on the new cornerstone, or is it a secret? I really don't remember everything about it. I mean, I wow. remember I, I put a piece of letterhead Did, in I was going to say. I, I wrote some words. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Tommy. Yeah. So you're going to live on long afterwards. I wonder what's in the cornerstone of my building. Can you x-ray it? Yeah, but, you know, something like paper doesn't show up. Oh. So. Do and you just have to leave it I'm forever? I'm not sure you can x-ray through stone. But. Do you have to leave it forever? Well, Does anybody ever take it out and look at it? I think that's done. I'm not sure what the, uh, protocol. What the uh, protocol is there. So I went to your website. Mm -hmm. I've been to your website a lot of times, but I just went to it today. Mm -hmm. Oh, my gosh, you've updated it. And I love how you have on your website dates that you can click on the date, like 18... 40 to 1880 and you click on there and you see all the renovations from that time that was that was the best way we could we found that we could organize the body work it's, it's also organized by building types uh, but so many things you can click like residences but that those are buildings that are or once were residences for example uh, the office is under residences uh, because it was a house uh, but the dates are particularly interesting, and I thought that would be a good way for a potential client if they had a structure. You know, if you were, if you have a, a craftsman structure, you're not necessarily interested in the 1840s structure. So you could just go to that time era and see the projects that we've done. I love so. it. You've got like six time, five or six eras. It's like 1840 right. to 1880. They sort of naturally clustered themselves into styles. Yeah. And there's so many new projects in there since the last time I looked. Well, we updated the website um, a year and a half ago. Um, the body of work is incredible. Those Thank log you. cabins that you've done Thank you. are just remarkable. Thank you. They've been, it's, uh, it's rather like forensic architecture because when something's been around that long, it's always been changed. And then majority of those structures we were trying to restore to a particular date, as in early construction era. Uh, and so finding those clues within the building 
of, of how old the nail is. You know, you can look at a nail and you can tell if it's a modern wire nail or if it's an old cut nail or if it's a hand wrought nail. And so there are things about the way things go together that help you understand when things happen so you know, ooh, if we're going to this date, then that's later, I need to take that out. You've done that into my house. You went into my house because you added an addition to my that's back right. room and I called you and said, I'm gonna put a room over here because my room was, my home is actually older than the Taborian Hall, hard to believe, but it's right. six years older. And it's a old frame craftsman house. Mm -hmm. And you, and I wanted to, so I didn't have a TV room. Right. A media room. So I called you and asked if you'd do a media room for me. And I was going to put it over here. And you were like, no, 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 no. It needs to go over here. And then you did a walk around the house. You matched all the windows. Nobody can tell it's an add on. And then you went to my side porch and you told me stuff about my side porch I didn't realize. And it was exactly like you said, it was forensic work. <laughs> right. You were like, this is, this right. is, this is an add on. I was like, really? And that, and that, you know, that's just from experience. That's just working on a variety of structures and paying attention. And, and looking, you did the same thing. The and you did the same thing at the Taborian Hall. You said, sure. this, is a, this, is, this is the old building built in the late 1800s. This part was added on in the 1960s. And I was like, what? And you're like, see that roof underneath? See the change in the brick? And I was like, right. absolutely. Right. right. Made total sense once he pointed it out to me. Right. So was there... Has, has, Tommy Jameson's or Jameson's Architect won awards for all the work you've done. We have won some awards. I yeah, bet yeah. you have. Um, it is, uh, you know, there's a number of venues that that architects can submit their work to get to get awards. You don't have time to do all that. The, the, well, and 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 it's very time consuming and it's expensive. And um, and you know how great you are. To enter, <laughs> to enter a project in say the Arkansas Chapter AIA awards, you have to prepare a large board. That is 30 by 40 inches and with text on it and color glossy photos and you've got to hire professional photography and so we've only received one state award the 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 other thing that happens in 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 big award projects you're oftentimes not necessarily in competition with new work but you're sort of in competition with new work <laughs> and uh and it, and it all depends i believe on the jury whether the yeah. jury is in tune with preservation work or not that's right and, and and so sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't the majority of our awards are from preservation entities such as uh, historic preservation alliance of arkansas we're doing the work that they appreciate and so that's where we've gotten the bulk of our awards so do you how do you get new customers word of mouth probably our work right now is averaging over the last 10 or 15 years is probably averaging about 70 to 75 percent repeat clients Oh, really? I mean, the state of Arkansas is one of our best clients. The Department of Heritage, we've worked for all four of their museums, currently working for two. Uh, Mosaic Templars was part of uh, uh, Department of Heritage. We have an own call contract at the old state house. We've been working for the Delta Cultural Center for 22 years. Wow. Uh, uh, and, and have done virtually all of their work in the last 22 years. So uh, that, 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 that's been ongoing work, so it's a lot of repeat work. And it's and it's word of mouth and it's internet and it's website. Well, and, well that website you that. ought to do good. I mean, that's well, thank beautiful. You. Thank I you. mean, that really. I look at a lot of websites. That's a beautiful website. If the listeners well, are interested in, arch in architecture, they need to go there and look at it. We were we were working on the rehabilitation of the Folk Building at Third and Main uh, for for a development company called Terraforma, and CJRW advertising was going to be the uh, the tenant. So we were working very closely with the the staff at CJRW, uh, as well as working for our, 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 our owner who was paying the bills. Um, and so developed a great rapport with them and they do website design. And well, no wonder it looks good. <laughs> yeah, no wonder you got the big dogs to make it. It's really nice. This is a great place to take a break. When we come back, Tommy is going to tell us all about preservation laws, historical tax credits and how to apply, and who can help you apply. We'll also get him to tell us what mistakes he sees most homeowners make when renovating. You're listening to Up In Your Business with Kerry McCoy. My guest is the architect and preservationist Tommy Jameson of Jameson Architects. You're listening to Up In Your Business with Carrie McCoy. 
I'm speaking today with the highly knowledgeable, he's going to roll his eyes again, preservationist Tommy Jameson of Jameson Architects. Tommy, I love this quote from the National Trust of Histor Historic Preservation. I got it off your website. The greenest building is the one that is already built. Right. That is a, that's just so true. People just want to go in and tear an old, wonderful building with old, wonderful uh, wood and beams that are like, you know, when I was doing the Dreamland Ballroom, I have in the ceilings these 12 by 12 inch wood beams that were cut from an oak tree. And they were going right. to burn them and put in two by fours. And I was like, no, don't throw those. Those right there, to me, are pieces of art. You can't even get trees like that anymore. Well, and it's, I was going to say, it's better material than you can go buy now. So how do we change those mindsets of people? Well, I think slowly uh, uh, um, it, it's, it's working. I mean, the, the preservation movement started in the late 60s. The 60s was an era that was not kind to historic buildings between urban renewal and, and, and the thing that, that things that everybody else did. Um, preservation started in the late 60s here in Little Rock with Ed Cromwell and John Trumper from the Cromwell firm, and that got Charles involved and Whistle. interested, and and, 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 and and so it's grown. And so you look at um, you look at this neighborhood now versus when I lived in this neighborhood in '77, and you see the impact of the positive side that Capital Zoning District Commission has had, that the MacArthur Park Historic District Commission has had, and uh, uh, protecting that neighborhood down around MacArthur Park. So things are, are looking a lot better. The frontiers are moving westward, uh, and, and there's, you know, Central High neighborhood, and, and the movement is, is going west. So there's been a lot of progress made. Um, the part that I find challenging, I suppose, right now are in towns like in East Arkansas, where the agrarian economy has changed and the population is down. I mean, um, Helena, one of my sayings about Helena is Helena has more historic buildings than people to take care of them. Uh, and, um. I, and I think it's related to, uh, you know, how many, how many people did it take to farm a thousand acres 60 years ago and how many is it take now? And it was probably like 50 and it's like three now. Right. And so uh, that's frustrating for me because we've done a lot of work in East Arkansas and there's been wonderful architecture that's been lost there. Yes, yeah, some of it's burned accidentally from well, abandonment. And and when families, uh, you know, a family's been in town a long time, and then they're, they they want their children to move elsewhere and have a better life or whatever, and then they own property, and then and then that generation passes on, and then you have a building that's owned by multiple um, um, uh, descendants all over the country, and it's hard for them to put money into that building, and so it substantially is demolition by neglect is the yeah. largest you know that's what happened to Ninth for Street. losing for losing buildings that's it's, what happened to Ninth nobody Street. can afford to keep them up right and i know a lot of people are like the the government should come in and save them but they can't go around doing that well, our tax base isn't that great right. right so let's talk about tax credits it's not as simple as it sounds uh you get tax credits for if, if you fall so okay you can you can start okay so there's there's two major sort of avenues of tax credits. One is federal tax credits. And, and to do any tax credit project or to get tax credits on any project, the, 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 the door is opened by being on the National Register or being a contributing structure in a National Register district. So the, if you're not there, it, it doesn't work. I mean, that's, that's what you have to start there. So you have to have a, a structure that's significant that the government feels like is significant. Uh, federal tax credits have been around um, since the, I think the preservation tax laws went in in like 76 and weren't substantially used until into the 80s and 90s. Um, they are a little unwieldy. Uh, you can use them. Uh, not everybody can use a federal tax credit. Uh, for example, my wife and I did tax credits on my office. Um, but because of alternative minimum tax, we're getting the tax credits at a very small amount per year and are probably going to expire in another year before I get to use them all. Because they last 15 years, right? I think 20. Oh, okay. I think it's 20. Uh, uh, now, so that's the federal tax credits. And, and the federal tax credits are not transferable. So I you thought you could buy them. You can't sell them. You can't sell your tax credits? It's federal. Fed you can sell your state. Correct, correct. 
which so is a new thing and I'll get to that. Okay. But the federal tax credits are just a little more burdensome. My understanding has been they always work best for a larger developer that may have a lot of passive income as opposed to the working stiff like me. Uh, so uh, you have to be careful with federal tax credits that you're really able to utilize. You have to be really rich. Well, or do a lot of development and have a lot of passive income. I mean, you, I think you can still take well. you can still take your tax credits, but they're just not going to be as big anywhere near offsetting the cost of re renovation. Well, it's twenty percent uh, for federal tax credits, and 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 you know I have clients fortunately that can use them, so they are good and they they do play a big role in leveraging larger projects. But you don't ever get to use your full 20% every year because of the minimum tax. An alternative minimum tax. Mm -hmm. And I, I spoke with Blanche Lincoln, Vic Snyder for years. I've, I've talked about that. But that, the, the story always comes back that alternative minimum tax was, as I understand it, which may or may not be fully correct, is that it was legislation in the 60s to close loopholes on what were then wealthy people. Uh, and it's a way to sort of make sure they don't slide through. Well, it was not indexed for inflation. Right. So what was wealthy in the 1960s is my wife and I working now, both having full-time jobs. And so it was not indexed for inflation. And uh, I think what Vic used to tell me was there's so much revenue that comes from alternative minimum tax that in the federal government, if you're going to do away with something, you got to find another way to make up that revenue. And, and so that way it, 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 has, it hasn't changed. It's not right, doesn't seem. Uh, but it but it hasn't changed. So Arkansas, I, I can't remember exactly when Arkansas tax credits came in six or eight years ago, something like that. Uh, and it might even be longer because time fa passes fast. <laughs> uh, Arkansas has now a 25% uh, historic tax credit, and that is for your state taxes. And and that legislation was passed, you know, in recent past, recent memory. Uh, which is layered on top of federal tax credits if you do both. But it was modeled, our legislation was modeled after other states uh, to where those tax credits are marketable. And, and they, there are entities that when you take your, get your state tax credits, if you choose not to use them yourself, they can be sold for roughly 85 cents on the dollar or something like that. And, and can be an instant revenue generator to help offset costs of, of your project. Uh, just recently, just this year, the tax credit base has been elevated. Uh, it was 25% of up to half a million dollars. Well, as, as an entry level legislation, that worked pretty good because that meant you could get up to 125,000 in tax credits. Wow. And it can work for residential, which federal tax credits don't. Federal tax credits have to be for income producing property where you can, you own your house, if you rehabilitated your house now and, and be in a contributing structure in the Hillcrest Historic District, you could get tax credits for it. So there's a whole lot more people getting state tax credits now than there were in the past with just federals. And our it's working so well that our legislature saw to raise that limit. Uh, the 125 max credit is now 400. And so it's working better for larger projects instead of a, the first 500,000. Say you have a project that's $3 million. Well, if you applied for state tax credits, you only get your credit on the first 500. Now it's more. So the Taborian Hall, if we decide to put in an elevator, could get yeah. tax credits I that way? So. Yeah. That might even pay for an elevator. It would pay for 25%. It's 25% of your rehabilitation costs. Every cost. time I have this show, I learn something. <laughs> And so it, you, can you, it be retroactive for any work you've done in the past? No. It's only going forward. It, you, you need to get approval first and then go forward. And you can double up your federal tax credits and your state tax credits. Yeah. Who do you call to do that? Uh, the Arkansas Historic Preservation Program. The young man there named Tom Marr. Well, he's not so young anymore. It was when he used to work for me. But, um. <laughs> so that's where he's gone to work, huh? Yeah, yeah. So you can use those up to 20 years. Federal. Federal and the state can be used instantly, and because you can sell it. Because you can sell. Them. And then who? So when you talk about consultants, you talk, you say you're a full project manager. You manage the whole project on your website. You say you man. You're not just an architect. You're Correct. a project manager. Correct. Which kind of separates you from a lot of other people. You don't just do drawings and then walk away. Right. Is a consultant 
part of your project management when you do you have a consultant that helps people with their tax credits? Is that part of your project management, or do you give them to the guy that worked for you at the state and say? No, he's the state employee, and he's the gatekeeper. He's who you give the forms to, and he's who approves it locally and sends it on to the uh, National Park Service for federal. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, he's the gatekeeper for where, where you start to get approval for your tax credits. If we have a client that wants to do historic tax credits, we oftentimes will... Uh, as sort of an additional service, assist them in their application for tax credits, yes. And, it, and it's a situation where you are documenting your building as it stands now, and then you document through drawings and, and, and photographs what you're going to do to the building, and that's, that's your application, basically. There's a, a, a lengthy, wordy uh, description process that goes in where you describe windows. You, what's there now, and what are you going to do to them? Are you going to repair them, or replace them, update them, uh, or, or you know whatever you're going to do? Uh, and you describe exterior surfaces and the roof and the windows and the doors and the masonry and the, the paint and the, the walls inside and the floors and the, everything that's there. You just it's a snapshot of what your building is now and then what you're going to do to it. You submit that. The state and or the National Park Service approves it. The project goes out and you build the project then that's a part one and a part two to get to there. And then part three is when the project's over, you document everything again and you show them that this is what we said we were going to do, here's what we did. And then you get your tax credits. And you can't get these tax credits unless you follow specific rules that they... that. Correct. The, the guideline for all restoration rehabilitation work is called the Secretary of the Interior's Guidelines for Historic Buildings. And is that... Is that um, um, it's firm or is it um, well it's, it's every it's, project specific you know, every project is different but there are if, if you if you cook it down to a few key things uh, it is it's better to repair than replace okay if that and that could go for windows for siding for brick for flooring for for anything uh, you know the, you they're encouraging you to keep your historic fabric and to make changes, if you have to make changes, make changes that are sensitive. For example, the Folk Building. You know, that was Bennett's military surplus for 40 plus years. Uh, there had, it had been former retail on second floor and third floor. They were big open spaces. Um, to rehabilitate it for business office use, we added two fire stairs, we added an elevator, we added bathrooms, yet, it was done in a way where you see significant fabric of the building. The cast iron columns that went down the middle are still there and you still see them. You have some sense of the open volume of those spaces. And that was a federal and state tax credit project. And on that one, we did do the application for the owner. I think that it seems like the federal and state like to see all the exposed new work that you do. Yes. I mean, you know, I mean it depends. It, it, it depends on what design element you're saying you're referring to. And once you've done the project, are you forever held and you got your tax credits? Next time you want to do something, do you have to go back and get it approved, or are for you forever a, held at that? For a federal tax credit, you have to hold the building for five years because it's income producing. You have to keep it. You can't just flip it the next year. Okay. So for federal, you have to keep it. And I think there are similar similar rules on state. After five years, if you decide you want to do something that's not completely approved by the National Park Service, is that okay? Or do you, would you get in trouble? Unless you want to get tax credits again for it. You could do it again then? Yes. That's really interesting. You can do another phase, or you can have a whole other project. Um, now, that being said, if you have any grant money involved, generally there are strings put on a proper, a conservation easement is put on the building to get the grant money. If you had a nonprofit that had owned Taborian Hall and, and and you applied for a grant and you got a grant as a nonprofit or whatever, then they would give you that grant money, but there would be a conservation easement on the building saying that this building needs to stay the way it is unless you come to us and seek approval first. In other words, you couldn't go do what you wanted to do. You'd have to say, this is what I want to do. Guys, here's what I want to do, but I'm doing it properly and it would be approved and then you would do it. 
so it's an open if you get a grant to do your work which is free money there are strings tied to it. there are strings tied to yeah. it and it and and it usually is an open-ended string it's forever true so there's not like you only have five years true which is similar to a conservation easement that you might do on your house which is an option um, you can get a conservation you can donate an easement on your house to the state of arkansas to the arkansas historic preservation program and say that this structure won't be changed without their approval donate it's, an it's easement not, what does that mean well it means you're giving away some value of your house because you're saying it won't be changed without their approval okay so you're tying the same strings that you would with a grant around it and for that you get somewhere between a 10 and 15 percent charitable contribution of the appraised value you mean they'll give you money no you get it like you gave it to your church it's a tax deduction. Oh, a charitable contribution. It's a charitable contribution. Like you gave it to, to a, a, a nonprofit. nonprofit. Yeah, exactly. But then you would be forever in, uh, tied to that. It's a conservation easement that goes in perpetuity. And it, what's perpetuity mean? Forever. Oh, gosh. Why am I guess so smart? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's all really, really So that's federal tax credits. That's state tax credits. That's conservation easements. Those are sort of the three tools the three primary tools that can assist in renovating, rehabilitating, restoring historic structures. What do you think is the biggest mistake most homeowners make? Mm. <laughs> I can't imagine working with a homeowner in their personal home space, and they, it seems like they'd be hysterical all the time. Probably the <laughs> biggest single thing is replacing their windows. That's probably the, and, and you know, everybody's bombarded by marketing where folks are you know wanting you to change those energy wasting windows for their new vinyl triple glaze yada 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 um, replacing windows is a uh, a high uh, windows in a in a historic structure are a, a major character defining element and when those are changed there's a lot lost uh, if if a structure has had its windows replaced uh, it may not be eligible for the national register it's that strong. I mean, it could prevent you from doing any tax credits because the windows have been replaced. Um, so windows are, are a mistake that everybody thinks that, that because the guys on TV say they're energy wasting and that, that, that they can't be fixed. Well, a historic wood window is just an assemblage of parts. And any part on that window can be repaired. And that window can be scraped down and the sills primed and painted and uh, the upper sash sealed and put a storm window on it and it can perform every bit as good, if not better, than a brand new window. You know, I don't ever have to worry about carbon monoxide poisoning at any of my... You've got some fresh air. i got fresh air. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're used to fresh air, you go into these really tightly sealed homes... And you will get an allergy attack because it is old dust and chemicals where they clean their house in. There can be those issues. There, fresh air is nice. I know people don't seem to think it's valuable because it is chillier in the, in the winter and it is warmer in the well, summer. And it's not as critical in Arkansas as, as it is in, say, Wisconsin. You know, oh. we're about 50% heating, 50% cooling. Uh, in, in the extreme in climates, it's, it's more of... It's, it's important to have less infiltration, for example, yeah. uh, when, you're, when, you're, when your temperatures are extreme. Uh, but here we're about 50-50, and spring and fall are great. And did you have any, uh, in, did any architects have an influence in your design, or, well, besides the ones you worked for? But we have some famous architects from Arkansas, um, when, Faye when Jones. I, well, when I was in college, Faye was dean of the School of Art. No way. Yeah, yeah, and I took a theory class with him in, uh, I believe, fourth year. Um, and I wish I could do it again. Now I, that you're I wish smarter? I could take that same class over, yeah. Isn't that Now that way? I would pay more attention than I paid when I was 20 years old. And then we've got the, so he he's known for the Thorn Crown Chapel in Fayetteville. Right. And I'm sure he's known for and other his, things. Uh, his body of work, yeah, it's amazing. And then we have uh, the Charles Thompson homes. Right, right. And well, the other architect that was influential to me was, uh, was, was a fellow named Cyrus Sutherland. Cy was one of my professors in second year, uh, but Cy taught 
two of the ancient history courses. When I was going through, we had to take four semesters of architectural history. And Cy si taught two of them. And I just loved his style. And then he was the guy when I was in fifth year where I took an elective called Restoration and Preservation, a three-hour elective, and Cy si taught that. And so Cy si really got me interested in historic architecture. So he was a major influence. What did he do? What, has he got some famous houses, you said? No, he... Uh, He's has, just a great teacher? He has written some great articles and a book or two uh, and uh, passed away a few years ago, uh, but left, left quite a legacy. And, uh, and then we have Frank Lloyd Wright, which it actually has a building. He didn't do anything in Arkansas. We're one correct. of the few states he didn't do anything in. I looked him up and was like, wow, he didn't, he didn't build anything in Arkansas. There's like Arkansas and Michigan are the only two states almost that he didn't build something. But, but we got Faye. So Faye's like a prodigy from you know, the Frank Lloyd Wright legacy. He studied under Frank Lloyd Wright. Oh, really? I didn't know yeah, that. I didn't realize that. Yeah. But Crystal Bridges brought in... Um, uh, the uh, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright house that is up there right now. Correct. And it's really neat. Have you been to see it? Yes. Is it permanent? Yes. Oh, I love it. Yes. I looked at it online. If anybody wants to see some great architecture, go to the Crystal Bridges in Bentonville. And it was one of Frank Lloyd Wright's he had an era where he did what were called the Usonian houses, which weren't big and grand houses like, like you find outside of Chicago. Uh, they, were, they were for blue-collar you know, smaller. I mean, that house is only probably, I don't recall exactly, 1,600 feet or so. Oh, is it? That's, yeah, it looks it's small. Very, it's yeah, very small. it may be 1,200. Yet it's got all of his design elements in it. So he Clean. felt he felt like good design should be, everybody should have access to it. He did the, um, what's that house? What, the, the water falling house in Pennsylvania. Falling water. Falling water house in right. Pennsylvania. Right. It Iconic. Iconic. I want to live in a house like that. And when I was reading about it, I read about his rival, Philip Johnson, right. who was always, you know, dishing him. They had two completely different styles, and Absolutely. they were kind of competing architects. And one of the funny things that Philip Johnson said was that they said, well, what do you think about, you know, some reporter was goading Philip Johnson and said, well, what do you think about the famous uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, wa uh, what would you call it, Falling Water House? And he said just makes me want to pee. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't ever heard that quote. I know. I loved it. I was glad I got to share that today. <laughs> Look, Tim's over there cracking up. <laughs> Do you have a period or a style you like? Nope. You don't? No. Nope. I'm surprised. I, uh, well, but not really. When I look at your body of work well, online, and, I'm and really that, not. And that's the thing. I, I feel more chameleon-like. I, I feel like I kind of turn the color of the style I'm working on. That's a true, that's an artist for you. Um, so every project runs over budget, right? No. Does it? No. Every project I've ever done has run over budget, and I was going to ask you if there's an average. <sighs> that, that's, I, I don't know that I could quote that. I mean, when, when there's a d defined budget, uh, it, it, sometimes it can't go over. There's no more. Well, so I, uh -huh. so the project adapts rather than the budget. Oh, that would be nice because I just always say, sure, do it. Yeah, okay. Right. Yeah. Right. So how do people get in touch with you? Well, I'm, I'm at my office 12 hours a day. <laughs> well, and what's the, and the, name, and the name of the website is? www.jamesonarchitects.com. And Jameson is spelled interestingly. Like the Irish whiskey. Oh, that's exactly right. Jameson with an E. With an E. Right. Do you drink that? And my <laughs> occasionally. And my and my uh, grandfather was John. John Jameson? <laughs> no. It's not the John Jameson. But <laughs> that is funny. Is that not J Jingleheimer Schmidt? Is that the same thing? John Jacob. Oh, that's John Jacob. <laughs> you can tell I read a lot of children's books when I was, you know, a few years ago. So people get in touch with you, Jameson Architects. And uh, I recommend everybody go to that website it is so good anything you want to tell our last our listeners before we get to head out we've got two minutes left thank you for having me T thank you tommy for coming on with sure. me you are awesome and for coming on you get a cigar All right. from the humidor room at colonial wine and spirits on markham street in little rock arkansas and that is for birthing jameson architects <laughs> And for caring about all of our historical homes and buildings in Arkansas okay. and really outside of that. Who's my guest next week? 
Two. Next week, it's going to be station director here at KBF, as well as local legend, Mr. John Kane. Can you believe that John Kane is coming on? He is a local legend. He has done he has done and seen a lot. I cannot wait to hear his stories. I hope he's listening to his own radio station right now so he can hear me talking good about him. Uh, look, he does, is he listening? He's not paying attention. Okay, if you have a great entrepreneurial story you would like to share, I would love to hear from you. Send a brief bio and your contact info to questions at upyourbusiness.org and someone will be in touch. And finally, to our listeners, thank you for spending time with me. If you think this program has been about you, you're right. But it's also been for me. Thank you for letting me fulfill my destiny. My hope today is that you've heard or learned something that's been inspiring or enlightening and that it, whatever it is, will help you up your business, your independence, or your life. I'm Carrie McCoy, and I'll see you here next time on Up In Your Business. Until then, be brave and keep it up. You've been listening to Up In Your Business with Carrie McCoy. Want to hear today's program again or want someone else to benefit from it? Jot this down. Within 72 hours, the podcast will be available at flagandbanner.com. Click the tab labeled Radio Show. There you'll find today's segment with links to resources you heard discussed on this program. Carrie's goal, to help you live the American dream.